Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. This is episode 365, guys. And gal, this is awesome. I know. We have with us our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hey, everybody. And Trainer Road in Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Hey, everybody. It's just us three, the Musketeers. (laughs) We're going to take what that means. What's that? We get to go deep on the product roadmap, give away all the secret sauce. Here we go. (laughs) Nate's not here. (laughs) We get to do whatever we want. It's going to be a good one. We're going to talk about rest intervals. That's actually the first question we're going to get to today. Uh, The whole point behind them, shrinking them for intents uh, or intentions of getting faster, all that stuff. This is going to be a good conversation on that. We're going to talk about getting fast on as little training as possible. We're also going to talk about race plans and Amber, this is like so well in your wheelhouse being the super domestic that you were, uh, we're going to be talking all about building a race plan and sticking to it. And other questions too. If you're joining us in the live chat right now on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. That would be super helpful. That makes it so that other people will see this. YouTube will push the video to other people and they'll be able to join and learn and get faster too. And if you're listening on any podcast app, thank you so much rate the podcast if you can, five stars, and let's get into it. So before we, uh, or I we're on the forum last week. Uh, first of all, we had a discussion of gears of the Chad, uh, that race, which we don't know if that's going to be the name, but, uh, doing a race up in the Spokane area, possibly we're entertaining this idea and there's a massive amount of interest. Uh, I think that I checked and this weekend with just like the questions we got through the podcast, cause we asked people to submit their interest there on the forum an overwhelming amount. There are a <laughs> lot of people that want this. So we'll see, uh, we're going to have to find a lot of things like a good race organizer that can work with Chad to build the right course, a brewery, of course, uh, for Chad, <laughs> uh, to be able to bring into this whole thing, maybe yeah. multiple. Yeah. It looks like find... Chad's already got ideas. <laughs> we can find many. Yeah. No, I, have, yeah. I have lots of ideas. If you go onto the forum, we have a thread, somebody named it gears with Chad, and then you can jump in there. So that's the, that's the, just like the working name, the working title, but it's a super smart name. I like it. It's good. I like it too. Uh, and there's polls within there too. So go and take those polls to give us feedback in terms of what you would want from the event. And we're excited uh, to hear from you within the forum as well. Somebody asked if we would cover a couple of questions that we're going to actually, and I said, I was going to cover them this week, but I'm going to cover them next week because I'm working on some data polls to see if we can get some information for you on this. It had to deal with plateauing and going through multiple base build and specialty cycles. And there was this question posited, like how many until you plateau when I really think that probably that question is flawed, but we want to see if we can get some data behind it to get some more information on it and then also breaking through plateaus. So look forward to that in a coming episode. Instead for now, let's get into Eddie's question. It says, how important is the length of the rest interval during VO2 max workouts? I know a lot of coaches recommend around a one to one ratio for work to rest. So a five by five workout would have five minute rests. Would lengthening the rests negate the benefits of this VO2 max workout? We'll get to that question, Chad, I'm because we have quite a bit to cover here, but I'm going to read the rest of the question as well. They mentioned the weather is getting nicer and I want to ride outside. I have some local quick climbs that give me around six to seven minutes of work, but they're separated by anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes of rest in between. For example, I did a route the other day that gave me work rest intervals of seven minutes and 20 seconds on and 20 minutes, 20 seconds off, seven minutes, 30 seconds on and 16 minutes, 25 seconds off. And finally, six minutes on and 10 minutes off. So four intervals with roughly seven minutes of work with 10 to 20 minutes of rest in between 10 to 20. That's a big range (laughs) that we're working with there. Uh, For the work, I have a minimum power in mind that I try to stay above, but it's basically all out for the climb. So am I missing out on VO2 adaptations by taking that much rest in between? Am I changing the workout by going all out with longer rests? Hope this makes sense. Keep up the great work. Love the podcast and software. And I'll give my vote for the two hour podcast link. Eddie will probably disappoint you this week. Absolutely going to disappoint you next week because it's my son's kindergarten graduation. Big day tassels, throwing hats, gowns. (laughs) Actually, I have no clue if they do that in kindergarten, but, um, next week will be very short, but we'll see what we do this week. Chad work to recovery ratios. Uh, there mm-hmm. was that poll positive idea that just one-to-one is what's recommended. And then in this case, we have a very different, uh, work to rest ratio that this athlete's working with, mm-hmm. uh, where do you want to start? <clears throat> well, it ranges all over the place. And I understand the concern because we do get hyper-specific and when we have such tightly scripted workouts, the workout recoveries or the recovery intervals look really specific. 
and probably 99% of the time they are, but it doesn't mean that if you fly a little bit outside of those bounds or even a lot outside of those bounds, you're going to miss the intention of the workout. So um, let, let's just start with what we're talking about, which is work to recovery ratios, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's just the ratio of how long you recover relative to how long you've just worked and the impact that that's going to have on everything else you do subsequently. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as work to rest ratio, and, and I'll, I will probably lapse into that terminology now and again, even though I don't really like it because recovery and rest aren't always synonymous. But if I do it, just forgive me, I do mean work to recovery. When we talk about work to recovery ratios, these really only pertain to moderate to high intensity work, right? Because we don't often break up aerobic endurance workouts with recovery intervals. So these are the intensities where adding recovery actually helps us accumulate more time at these intensities, which is basically the nature of interval training. So this brings us to the objective of work to rest ratios. There, there I go already work to recovery ratios. So primarily we're looking to maximize the training stimulus. And, and a lot of the times this is in a narrow time frame because we're all, you know, time poor to, to some degree, but it's also in general, how do we spend or how do we send rather the, the strongest, clearest signals and prompt pretty specific adaptations that make us faster. So simply, how do we make the most of our limited training time? And the answer is really just by strategically leveraging these recovery intervals. And we do this through in workout recovery, such that we can improve our chances of optimizing or getting as close to optimal as possible, the effects of that day's work. And this is accomplished in a few ways. And there's often a lot of overlap between these ways. So first it helps us elevate the overall workload productively. It's not just about cranking it up as high as you can, digging as deep a hole as possible, and then figuring it out from there this is a productive, progressive increase in the total work performed. And a lot of the times the work is really specific. Most of the time it is. Secondly, it helps us increase oxygen consumption. And as aerobic and endurance athletes, this is almost always our primary concern. And thirdly, arguably at least as important as the other two, maybe more important is it helps us manage RPE or perceived exertion. It manages, it helps us manage our, our, our motivation, our suffering, our perception of the work we're doing favorably. We, we basically use the promise of relief to encourage ourselves to further that hard work, to hang in there, gut out one more interval, get through the sticking point in this interval, et cetera. Self-manipulation at its finest. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's pain management. It's a coping mechanism. Call it what you want. Yeah. Pro the promise of just a little bit of rest or maybe a lot of rest is uh, very, very motivating. And then fourth, and this is in a race or a competition context only, so it's not going to apply to everybody, but in this context, eventually we want to increase the specificity of the recovery durations to really mimic the demands of our events, to, to make the recovery emulate as closely as possible race scenarios. And this is a form of familiarization and that makes it largely psychological, but the ends being to be prepared in as many ways as possible. And I'm sure both of you can relate. I mean, do you perform better when you can avoid being blindsided by changes in where you have to find your recovery? Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's, um, We've mentioned this before, right, Amber, where it's like, uh, we're really good at, like, we can actually do more than we give ourselves credit for. And in many cases, since we just assume that that break that we're trying to hold on to, or the field that we're trying to hold on to or something else, we assume whatever effort they're at now is going to be perpetually consistent. <laughs> like mm -hmm. they're just going to keep going at this. Thusly, I can't hold on. And it's kind of the same with interval work, huh? Where it's like, you know, because you know that it does end. And because you know that you mm. do get a break, it really is kind of cool how like much more work we can do and how much time we can accomplish in those zones. Just when we know that there's rest and we don't know that's the tricky part. <laughs> so true. Yeah. And that really emphasizes the psychological component of all of this. So recovery is definitely physiological. I mean, it's really hard to deny that, but man, the psychological component is, is a big one. Okay. So let, let's get back to how we increase that overall workload. So, so the question is pretty simply, how does recovery allow us to do more? And one of the ways is it allows us to replan it, replenish anaerobic energy stores. So this allows us to do more high intensity work and even moderate intensity work, because even when we do sweet spot work and tempo work, we're still dipping into those anaerobic stores a bit. 
And in doing so, we actually increase the amount of the high intensity training or moderate intensity training that, that we can accomplish. And in doing so, we derive a stronger training stimulus. So the, uh, well, that's the gist of it. And then another way that recovery facilitates increased workloads is it allows us to maximize the interval output. So per interval recovery allows us to do more efforts. It allows us to work at higher intensities dur during those efforts. And then all sorts of combinations of the two. But this is this perfectly illustrative of why these recovery intervals use specific durations, specific ratios, because as, as I just described, on the one hand, longer recovery is going to lead to greater anaerobic energy fuel replenishment. But on the other hand, shorter recoveries lend to higher ox uh, oxygen consumption levels. Add to that. If you recover for too long, it can lead to disengagement, the psychological component we just talked about. You can actually lose motivation by recovering for too long. Just your head's mm -hmm. not in it anymore. Make them too short and pretty simply you overwhelm yourself with the workload. And that leads to just less total work overall, less of a, an adaptive stimulus is, is delivered. And this isn't even mentioning the intensity of the recovery interval at this point in the discussion, mm -hmm. but clearly there's a balance that has to be struck based on the workout objectives human physiology and psychology, because again, consider the necessity of managing your perception and, and maintaining your motivation, both prior to the workout, obviously in the workout and even post-workout when you're looking ahead at the workouts to come. I mean, we direly need a mental reprieve or reduction in this perceived exertion to reestablish our focus in the moment, refine motivation for the next workout, reset pain tolerance at, at any point along the way. Hmm. Okay, so that's the the uh, I don't know the the lecture portion. Now we'll get to the the handful of studies that I've got, and I've got a couple that I want to use to just illustrate points I just made, and then I've got a couple that are kind of an add-on, basically a topic I've wanted to cover for a long time, very related to recovery intervals. So first, I'll provide an example of how the recovery duration impacts our ability to maximize the workload, and it's a study from 1993, Balsam and colleagues use runners and had them sprint for 40 meters. And they either follow this by 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or 120 seconds of recovery. So these are clearly anaerobic efforts. However, the oxygen consumption over them during the recovery intervals ratcheted from, well, I guess it down ratcheted from 66% to 57% to 52% of VO2 max. Point mm -hmm. being is that the shorter recovery intervals led to higher VO2 during the recovery at rest, which means higher VO2 starting subsequent intervals, which can increase time at higher VO2 in those subsequent intervals. So the takeaway is that the duration of the recovery intervals following short intense work intervals in this case, does impact oxygen uptake in the following intervals. And sometimes this is the objective and sometimes it's not. So manipulating that allows us to steer that objective. And then uh, an example of how recovery intensity impact, impacts that workout productivity is a study from 2008 by Thevin A and colleagues where they took endurance trained youngsters and youngsters like uh, I think 16 was the median age plus or minus a year, had them run 30, 30, so running again, and they followed it by recovery at either 50%, 67%, or 84% of their work interval velocity. So they either oh. ran half as fast or they ran nearly as fast and then right in between. And side note, at, at Trainer Road, the workouts use 40% of FTP. And this equates for most people 30, 35% VO2 max. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to get to that later. Another note that 84% in this case corresponded to their lactate threshold pace. So think of running at your FTP Whew. and then that 67% value fell halfway between. So 50%, 84 threshold, and then split the difference to see, you know, what happens when we run medium hard. And now and I know why they, they use 16 year olds. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> do it again. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. You get old uh -huh. enough, you get wise enough to not do such things. <laughs> I've never seen as much puking in my life as I saw at high school track events. I, I, oh. I coached track and field for a little while. Man, there was a lot of vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> like that scene in Goonies. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so they were trained to uh, looking to observe two things. One was the time necessary to reach 90% of VO2 max. So they wanted a, a very high percentage of their VO2 max. And the second was the time spent at that high percentage at that 90% of VO2 max, because the focus was on optimizing their aerobic uptake, you know, their oxygen consumption. 
And interesting and pretty counter to what you might expect is that the recovery intensity actually had no effect on the time to achieve 90%, on the time to ratchet it up to that high intake. It seemed that regardless, the short recoveries kept VO2 lifted regardless of the recovery intensity. But hmm. regarding the time spent at 90%, at that high percentage, when they recovered at 84%, as you might expect, it led to significantly lower time to exhaustion. Athletes faded hmm. faster which means they accumulated less time at high oxygen uptakes, consumed less oxygen. So kind of missed the point of the training objectives, missed those objectives. When they recovered at 67% or 50%, it was similar in most ways, but time to exhaustion was greater, meaning the athletes lasted longer at 50% VO2 max recoveries. Again, that's we, we'd expect that. And this totally supports the case for the easiest, and I use air quotes, recovery intensity. Because my personal stance on this has always been why make VO2 max recoveries, specifically with the short, short workouts, but really with uh, VO2 max in general, miserable. If the training outcome, the stimulus, the percentage of VO2 max achieved, all those things is similar. You know, why not make it as easy as possible, increase compliance, increase confidence and motivation, reduce the dread going into these workouts, the high perceived exertion during these workouts, and save those tougher recoveries for more specific training. And this I see to be somewhat in line with the notion of MED, the minimal effective dose. Why do more? Duh. Why hurt more it. than it's necessary <laughs> when the benefits are the same? Yeah. That was like in my head flashing like a neon sign. Right? I was like, minimal effective dose. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there, there's two points I want to cover really quick with this, Chad. Now, when you talked about the time to achieve that VO2 max, right? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with 30 thirties. And I want to put that in context and contrast that between like five by five. Right. Yeah, we'll get, so, we'll get to that. Yeah. Cause that's 30 important... seconds by 30 seconds, five minutes by five minutes. Correct. Yeah. And that's why, uh, Chad, when you do 30 thirties, I mean, even though you're doing one-to-one -one ratios, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to recover. Mm -hmm. So every subsequent interval that you hit, Chad, you're just getting closer and closer. Whereas you may start at a lower max. baseline when you do those mm -hmm. longer rests, when you're talking about a five minute by five minute, sorry, Amber, for keeping mention, we were talking about just before this, how like pro racing can cause like a PTSD response <laughs> in Amber sometimes. <laughs> and I think that five by fives might actually cause a stronger reaction from Amber. She's expressed her, her absolute mm -hmm. dislike of those, those but sorry, bad. I just wanted to point out that difference, Chad. So then athletes aren't taking that one thing that you say, cause this happens all the time. They'll say, Chad said this ergo. And, and I, I just want to make sure that people understand if mm -hmm. you're doing five by fives, you have time to be able to drop down in between. If you're doing 30 thirties and I'm using these two examples and clearly there's a mm -hmm. spectrum in between, but if you're doing 30 thirties, the point is to not allow you to reset to a baseline, so to speak in between the efforts and to ramp it up. Um, mm -hmm. so just want to make sure that part's clear Yeah, with a five minute VO two max interval. And, and what, what, what is, uh what's being described here. They're like seven minute intervals, right? So I assume those are going to be 105, 106, you know, just a little over, but still pushing that, that slow component up, pushing toward VO2 max over the course of it, very uncomfortable, but that gives you a lot of time to ramp up to that high, high, higher VO2 max with the short ones. You don't have a lot of time. So we got to keep you up there effectively, yep. but to, to close out that study back to the 67% the group, because it is a, a finer point, but an important one, they experience shorter time to exhaustion as you might expect on the 50% guys, but on their way to exhaustion, they spent a, a significantly higher percentage of their time at that high target VO2. And if you didn't follow under, understandable, simply it, it was more time efficient. That's all I'm saying. And, and I mentioned this because it forms at least part of the rationale for Veronique Billot's and trainer Rhodes use of Veronique Billot's reduced amplitude billets, where we only come down to 88% instead of returning to 40%. And I mentioned, or I'm sorry, and, and this is the, the objective there is increasing the recovery intensity because we're trying to increase the time spent at that high O2 uptake, but also helps us stimulate the, the race specificity that a lot of those specialty plans are gearing toward. My favorite type of workout. Seriously. I, there, I love those. Man, if you're going to go race mass start stuff, especially highly cornered um, stuff where you have to do a lot of accelerations, they are very much in line with what you have to do because you never mm -hmm. get full recovery. Even if you're on a downhill, those, <laughs> yeah. they blip by so quickly, they're almost of no impact at all. You just need yeah. to learn how to full gas, barely ease off, full gas, barely ease off and do it for, I mean, quite a long time. P12 yep. crits last 90 minutes, 90 minutes of that stuff. <laughs> Take yeah. one of those and bleed it into one 90 minute interval. <laughs> so it's a long, hard fight.
Okay, so with those those in mind or behind us, I do want to use this as an opportunity to discuss a couple studies that either informed or managed to support the why of the active recoveries that you'll see peppered across almost every trainer road workout, you know, high intensity, moderate intensity workout, and why we or I have landed on 40% of FTP. So what, what informed this in the first place, at least one of the studies that did was back in 2004, a study by DuPont and colleagues where they actually used 1515s on the bike and they followed it by either active recovery or passive recovery. The active being at 50 to 60% of FTP. They quantified it in VO2 max, but if we you know roll that across, it's about that in FTP. And then of course the passive, they just sat on their bikes. So with the, the, the time to exhaustion with the passive group was on average about 16 minutes. It was anywhere from 11 to 21 minutes. Time to exhaustion with the active was seven minutes. So we're talking less than half. The point being that in most cases, passive recovery is more likely to extend our working time and increase that training stimulus during high intensity, moderate intensity work. So the question then becomes why, why spin during recovery intervals at all? And other things informed this, but something that backed it up and made me feel a bit validated was a study that we've actually discussed before. And I think we actually discussed that other one before also, but this was 2018. Wheel Wahova and colleagues helped answer the question of why I keep recovery active, especially when some of the literature, we just talked about it, supports passive recovery during high intensity training, especially when Crestrup and colleagues in 2006 used soccer players to debunk the notion that active recovery facilitates lactate clearance. You know, they demonstrated that blood lactate has little to do with muscle lactate. The two were not correlated, at least with on-off on activity. And they also pointed out research that demonstrated that neither blood lactate nor muscle lactate has demonstrated a direct relation with performance capacity. We've talked about this in a number, a number of times. Lactate is not, not poison. It's not the demon it's associated with, et cetera. All of which, again, has us asking, why keep our legs moving at all if we have the option? Well, according to Wheel Wahava, and I fully agree with this, time spent recovering actively, spinning lightly at, say, 40% of FTP, allows continuation of training at low intensity, which could stimulate adaptations that we miss if we were just to sit there recovering passively. And this is yet another effort to maximize the signal, to attain the most training stimulus from the least amount of time. And 40% is very close to doing nothing, but it retains the benefits of doing something. This is, this is the, the basis of it. Even psychologically speaking, like doing a hard effort and then just not doing anything, then going back into doing the hard effort. Yeah. It seems like it's harder in my mind. And, and I don't know why it could just be purely psychological and I might be able to think my way right out of that pretzel. I don't know, but <laughs> that's like, uh, just thinking of doing something and then just sitting there. And doing something, I almost feel like if it, okay, listeners, let me know if you feel this way. Uh, I'm, <laughs> this is not scientific. This is journey, like magic school bus into my brain over here. But uh, <laughs> if I take time to just like do nothing in between intervals, I swear I make that interval I just did harder. And what I mean by that is psychologically, I convince myself if I'm doing nothing, it's like I, I can just purely focus on the discomfort I just experienced. Whereas if I'm just moving forward at 40% of FTP, something that really isn't that difficult. It's like, I, it's like I'm making progress into the next interval. I'm moving forward. I'm doing something and I don't dwell on the past quite as much. That could just be how my weird brain works. See, but, it is psychological and it's exactly that disengagement that I was that I touched on mm -hmm. earlier. It allows you just an opportunity to, to let go just a little, to let your focus slip just a little. And maybe sometimes yeah. it's beneficial, but not always. Yeah. This messes up your rhythm, man. Yeah. Yeah. That too. Right. <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe we've conditioned ourselves into this hole. You have me questioning everything. What's the, what's the point of our existence? Anyways, Chad, sorry. Uh, for <laughs> okay, no, I'm just going to wrap up with uh, direct questions to, to or questions, answers for Eddie's questions. First, yes. Recovery duration is important, especially in relation to the objectives of your workout. But when you ask, will long recoveries negate the VO2 max workout benefits? And I think we've already kind of covered this. It's probably just the opposite. You're doing really long VO2 max intervals and optimizing or getting close to optimizing that workload stands a far better chance with those longer recoveries. I have some practical stuff. I want to talk about this, but Amber, what, what thoughts do you have before we go into my practice? I was side? going straight to the practical side too. So Sweet. you go take for it, it away. <laughs> <laughs> I was, well, you know, with all of that said, I mean, it's, 
there are different times when you're going to want to have different rest intervals. And one of the things that you can do, if you really want to get that workout where you have a shorter rest interval than what you have spaced between those climbs around where you live is just your repeats on the same climb. Hmm. You have to be really aware of and careful about traffic. But you know, what I used to do is if I had a three minute effort, um, or a series, like a set of three minute efforts, ride three minutes up the hill and then coast down. Uh, not coast, I would spin down the hill. And sometimes I would even lightly run my brakes a little bit. So I had some resistance. I could spin my legs on the way down. I wasn't just doing what we just talked about where you do a really hard effort and then stop moving mm -hmm. your legs, but come back down the hill as your recovery, maybe spin around a little bit at the base of the hill and then go up again. And you can really, um, it becomes pretty easy to get down to like a one-to-one -one rest work ratio, if that's what you're looking for that day. So you don't, necessarily you can work with the terrain around you and get a little bit creative to to get what you need out of the workout that day if you want to something this is maybe hyper specific and not relevant for everybody else but i typically have to factor in 15 seconds for a turnaround so what i've found in that situation amber that I, that's how i do the majority of my workouts when i'm outside is turning mm -hmm. around and doing the same section of road or something else again and I try to factor in 15 seconds for a turnaround. That lets me slow down. That lets me take the turn safely. That safely. lets me get back in and find the right gear and be ready to go. And mm -hmm. if you think about it that way, 15 seconds to turn around twice, that's 30 seconds that you need. So then that kind of gives you an idea if you have intervals that have shorter breaks, why 30 thirties would be really complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like 30 thirties are best usually done instead of turning around all the time, because you'll be cross-eyed and sideways and not safe anyway. Instead, yeah. it's a significant or like a consistent stretch of road where you can go 30 on 30 off on that stretch of road. And then you just turn around at the end of the set and then you can redo it. But that turnaround approach, and I know maybe somebody's listening to this and being like, well, of course you turn around. That's what I've always done. But maybe other people are new to this and they, they haven't had that experience. And I think it's really super important advice to understand that. And that could help you shrink that because I honestly, Chad, I'm a bit concerned looking at that, just looking at 20 minutes in between VO2 max efforts. If you're, it, it, it doesn't seem like in this case that our, that this athlete is following a train road plan could be, I don't know, but in that case, what you'll find is through our workout progressions, we'll shrink rest strategically as you progress through any sort of energy system or intensity will increase or any number of different things will change. But shrinking rest is a common adjustment that you'll see as, you, as an athlete gets fitter or a coach wants to make things more challenging for an athlete. They'll have them do the same work, just rest less in between. And, mm -hmm. th and that is, so if you're doing something where it's 10 to 20 minutes in such a wide range, if you're going out to accomplish specificity, you're getting a huge chunk of it with making sure that your work uh, intervals are hitting the targets there. But the rest does matter. And something that I tell myself that might not be true, because sometimes I'm tempted to extend that rest a little bit, <laughs> is that the, the rest intervals are what make a, the difference for me. Like if I'm being diligent, it's easy to be diligent on the work intervals, but are you, and I say that relatively speaking, but are you being diligent with your rest intervals too? And mm -hmm. it's that sort of diligence and adherence that really does allow you to progress week over week and start pushing the limits very strategically. And for me, I know that when I feel ready to go beforehand, that fills me with so much confidence. Like if I'm doing, if I'm doing five by fives, sorry, Amber, but if I'm doing five by fives, it's and fun. I get down and after four minutes of rest, I'm like, to be honest, I think I could go again already. I don't make myself go. I stick to my workouts targets, but that fills me with immense confidence to know that sort of thing. That's an extremely rare circumstance of five by fives, by the way. But uh, when that does happen, that's a really cool thing. And it's a sign mm -hmm. that you're adapting to training and getting stronger. And it's really exciting. So don't just ignore the rest intervals and let them be whatever they're going to be. If you're able absolutely try to control them and great tip by Amber from being able to use the road and turn around and use the same section of road over and over again. So any other points that we want to make on this one? Cool. Sandy's question. Uh, Sandy says, can you point me in the right direction to a podcast that describes executing a race plan right here, Sandy, this is the episode. Amber's going <laughs> to crush this got one. You. <laughs> <laughs> Racers and athletes uh, you have on the podcast always talk about their quote race plan and quote sticking to a plan. And I want to know more about that. 
the structure of a plan, what sort of things they focus on, et cetera. I also would like to listen to an episode that describes what riding your own race, and that's saying that in quotes, means in practice and during a race. I get stuck in my head during races and I'm trying to practice this, but would like more tips on how to do this. So thank you. Love the podcast from Sandy. Amber, take it away. <laughs> thank you. Um, this one, I think we can all contribute a lot in terms of what we've experienced and observed. So please feel free to jump in. Um, but I get, guess a good place to start is to talk about what is a race plan in the first place. Um, and it's just a plan that you have going into a race. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about this, but I think it's important before we do that to talk about outcome goals versus process goals. This is something that we've talked about many times before, but it's important to distinguish between what is within your control and what is not within your control when you're making a race plan. And it's, it's totally okay to use, uh, to incorporate things that are within and without within your control and not within your control in a race plan. But you have to be understanding and prepared that if you, if part of your place race plan includes something that's not within your control, that you may have to adapt on the fly if circumstances don't allow you to execute that part of your plan. Um, on the other hand, you, it's really important to incorporate aspects of your plan that are within your control so that you, you can absolutely walk away from the race, um, confident that you can, you can tick a box, you know, that you've had some of those smaller process wins. Cause that'll be really important just for learning and development and confidence. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> a plan is really a combination of process goals that are within your control and maybe some outcome and strategy goals that may or may not pan out the way that you hope. So those can be held a bit more loosely than the process goals that are within your control. And what you include in a race plan is really up to you. It's, it's what do you as an athlete need? Where are you in your racing career? What are the things that you want to be working on? What are the, some of the things that you think have been holding you back? Um, and how can you be addressing those and improving those in a given race scenario? So these can include things like, um, a plan for what you're doing pre-race and pre-race could include, how are you preparing for the race the week before the day before even the morning of. A uh, race plan can include what you're going to do during the race. We'll talk about that too. And then it can also include what you're going to do post-race. So if you're going to a race where it's going to be really cold or rainy, you want to make sure you have a plan for getting warm and dry after that race because you don't want to get sick. Um, there's a whole host of things that you can do to incorporate planning in pre-race, pre during the race, and post-race. So let's start by talking about pre-race routine and plan. And this is really just what can you do before the race to improve your mental and physical state during the race? It's pretty simple. And there are things that you can do the week before. Um, maybe that looks like reviewing the course and the terrain. So if you have an opportunity to go ride the course beforehand, uh, check it out on Google Maps, uh, Google Earth, talk to other people who've raced the race, that can really help you start to mentally prepare and get you into a good mental state going into the race. Um, that can also help inform your race plan for during the race by identifying potential selection points and where you want to be during the race. And we'll get to that in a little bit. You can also review the start list. So you'll know which of your competitors are going to be there and you can know maybe, all right, these folks are going to be looking for a breakaway. This person's a really good sprinter and it can start to give you an idea of how the race might pan out given the people who are going to be there, their strengths and weaknesses and how they typically race. So you can already start to have an idea of potential race dynamics. Um, you can do a lot to reduce your cognitive load on race day by preparing with lists and alarms. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a favorite strategy of mine. So packing lists, uh, setting alarms for nutrition, sleep, when you need to depart for the race, having all of that decided ahead of time can help so much in reducing your stress on race day. Um, on race day, your pre-race plan can include things like having a playlist that either pumps you up if that's what you need, or that calms you down if that's what you need. <laughs> um, it can include your warm up. What kind of a warm is warm up is going to put you into both a good physical state and a good mental state for the start of that race? Um, what is the order in which you like to do things? Do you like to go and be early to registration, get your number pinned? How, what are the things that make you feel good and ready on race day? And that's your pre-race plan on the day of. Um, pre-race plan also includes nutrition. So this is something that you can start thinking about way ahead of time. You know, how long is the race? What's the weather gonna look like? What are you gonna need for in terms of hydration and calories? Um, what are the things that your body is used to? 
how much are you going to need? When are you going to want to take that in? You can combine that with course recon to say, ideally, I'd like to eat every 30 minutes, but I can see that there's this really technical section here that might not be a good place to eat. You can identify places on the course you want to eat. Uh, that's another thing that can reduce stress on race day because you've already thought about it and made some decisions ahead of time. And then the other part of your race plan might be a uh, pre-race plan might be equipment and gear prep. So choosing equipment, um, what gearing do you want? What tires do you want to run? Even if you're not choosing from a myriad of, of equipment choices, making sure that your equipment is ready. It's race ready. So take it to the bike shop for a quick safety check. Are the brakes good? Are the tires in good condition? Um, making sure that all of your gear is prepared and ready for race day is really, really helpful. And doing that ahead of time, again, takes away a lot of stress. So that's, that's just a piece on pre-race planning. Uh, what are some things that you guys do when you're preparing for a race and planning for a race that are, that you would do pre-race either week out or months out or day of? I'm a big course reconner myself. So I'll try to get GPS files. If it's a road race, like it's a criterium. I even look at Google street view. Uh, I'm thinking back to Tulsa tough is the last crit that I did on an unfamiliar course. And I Google street viewed my way all around that course. I watched other <laughs> videos of races that had gone on there to try to look at the course, but then also to try to understand how racing unfolded on the course too, mm -hmm. because there's one side of things where it's like, I know my strengths and weaknesses as a rider. And this is how I could typically imp like execute in a criterium to do well, but a course and the type of field that you're racing against really, it absolutely, th those two are, have more bearing in many cases than your abilities as an athlete. And you have to work with those. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really like the recon aspect and I try to take in as much information as I can from it. Uh, so like I said, digitally, mostly in, in those cases, that's one thing that I like to do. Chad, how about you? <clears throat> These days with gravel routes, kind of be in my jam. And if, if uh, most events these days, I think pretty much everyone gives you a TCX file to load. If you're going to be mm -hmm. off road, yep. or even if, if, if you're on road, I'm pretty sure that's standard fare yeah. these days. So it I'll load be. that. If it's not, it should be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll load that and then look at it on Strava so that I get kind of a feel for, you know, where the elevation is and whatnot. It, just what Amber said, if it's a lap course, especially where I'm going to eat, uh, mm -hmm. and, and just, even if it's not highly detailed, I could still get a feel for, okay, there's this much elevation. It's, it's going to, these, you know, the conditions are going to be hot either way. I consider what the day is going to be like so that I can kind of determine how long I'm going to be out there. And then that will dictate my eating plan. So going in, I know I'm going to have to pack this many calories. If they offer this many aid stations, aid station review is another, maybe something that doesn't impact a race. You're not hitting aid stations. There may be feed feed zones, but with more, uh, uh, loosely structured events, you know, stopping at aid stations, knowing that you can bank on three aid stations over the course of an 80 mile gravel ride, for instance, obviously impacts your nutrition plan. Mm -hmm. And then just, like I said, just knowing how long I'm going to be out there will influence my, my intended pace. The day may shape that a bit and my nutrition plan, especially, and even departure and arrival times. I mean, there are cases mm -hmm. where I know <laughs> these days I've kind of moved more towards chickening out. I'll sign up for the long course and then I'll show up and just do the short course. And sometimes that comes about on the fly. <laughs> sometimes it comes about because the long course starts too early and I'm driving there morning of mm -hmm. well not, but, uh, I, I always reserve the right to, to, to shorten the course a bit, but that that'll impact drive time, you know, prior to, I need to leave at this time. If I'm going to make this course, if I hit traffic, I'll do the slower course. So I kind of have a backup. It's not a race plan exactly, <laughs> but, uh, an event plan. I, two other things that I like to do. I like to, so on longer events and even so in shorter races where taking a nutrition is pretty straightforward, like a criterium, I'm going to carry a couple gels or I'll have a bottle with mix and that might be it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but a longer race, what I like to do is I like to break down my nutrition by hour. I start with knowing that I'm going to take in X amount of carbs per hour and that's how I drive everything. So in most cases, I'm going to be looking at taking in hundred to 120 grams of carbs an hour. So then I think, okay, so for hour one, how am I going to do that? Is it going to be through one of three methods? Am I going to be consuming that through a bottle? Am I going to be consuming that through a gel? Am I going to be consuming that through a hydration pack, depending on the sort of event? So then I think and plan appropriately. Chad helped me with this at Leadville. I think that we took up the entire kitchen island with just bottles and hydration <laughs> packs and everything else. And 
there was carved dust all over the place. Um, but, uh, so with this though, it, it really helps just to think of it in terms of hours. And then I even label the bottles like hour one, hour two, or feed one, feed two, depending on the event or the, and the gels and everything else. And I get them into groups and then that way it makes it really easy. So that on race day, I don't even have to think about it. It's all laid mm -hmm. out and I just simply grab things and I move through it. That's a really big thing that helps me. The alarm stuff that you mentioned, Amber, I absolutely work backward from race start and I give myself all the time I need and I lay out what that timeline will be. Um, the, the final thing that I think is really important for the race is to, and I, I know that we're going to get into the racing portion soon, mm -hmm. but you talked about building out this strategy and how you, the things that you can control and the things you can't control, and then building a strategy off of that. I run through that strategy before a race thoroughly. Like I go through it in my head and I'm not saying I go over it and try to iterate and improve once I've decided on it, that's it. But I make sure that I'm fully familiar with it. I think through all the different avenues. So, okay. So you get a flat tire through here. Does that mean your plan goes out the window? What contingencies do you have in place? Right. And I try to think through every possible avenue rather than being surprised by things, by a wrench getting tossed into the spokes on race day. Because that happens many times, the longer the race, the more complicated the race, the more opportunity for that. And I have absolutely been guilty of in the past is not thinking through those things. So then when they catch me by surprise on race day, I completely abandoned my race plan. And looking back, I didn't need to just because mm -hmm. something came up that was unexpected. I should have just thought through that and thought, what if this happens? What do I do? And that is something I feel like that takes time for me to sit down and really just think through all of this but I really find it helpful because it gives me a lot of calm on race day. I'm almost expecting a bad thing to happen. And it's okay if it does, because I have something in place and if it doesn't happen, fantastic, even better, but it's really tough when you kind of stick too close to a strategy. And this is what I'm hopefully hoping this is a good transition for you, Amber, but yeah. when you have a strategy that's super strict or rigid, and then if any one single thing changes, it feels like the whole thing goes out the window. That's really mm -hmm. hard. Well, what you're describing are a couple of things. And the bigger thing I think is important to mention here, because this is a really powerful tool that you can incorporate into a pre-race routine is visualization, visualizing mm -hmm. the race and everything that we're talking about here. These are things that you can do. They're not things that you have to do. So cherry pick what we're talking about here and decide what are the things that are really resonating with you that feel like they would really help. So for some people, visualizing success in the race is really, really important. For other people, visualizing success and potential problems can be really helpful because it's a way of virtually practicing your response in a very low stress, non-threatening environment to what could go wrong. And I remember hearing an interview at one point with Michael Phelps after the Olympics, and he had won an event, his goggles fell off when he dove in the water, but he managed to stay calm and focus on the race because prior to the event, he had done visualizations, imagining all the things that could go wrong, including having his goggles fall off. So when they did fall off, it was as if he had practiced that scenario many times and was completely prepared to respond and it didn't catch him off guard. Like you said, for other mm -hmm. folks envisioning or visualizing things going wrong might be incredibly stressful and counterproductive. It just depends on you and what's going to help you. So that's something that you found Jonathan, that really helps you a lot. Yeah. Yes. With ski racing, I always had the anxiety thing happen to me. Like profound anxiety is because I'd be visualizing the course and then I, my ski would come off. I'd hit the gate. I'd blow a gate. I'd, I'd mess up on my line and I'd get late. And then I was like, ah, I ruined it. I need to start over. Ah, I ruined it. I need to start over. And I kept <laughs> doing that. And because I was so terrified of something sabotaging, sabotaging that positive thought process and me visualizing success. And what, mm -hmm. and I've mentioned this before on the podcast, a profound changing moment for me was when I stopped avoiding that deviation from success in my visualization process. And instead I embraced it and I saw where it would go mm -hmm. and I let my, my mind go in that direction. And then I thought, okay, how do I get back? And that was like be... a huge change that alleviated a lot of anxiety for me. Instead of fearing that something bad could happen, I was ready and able to work through it. Um, a great example of this just a couple of weeks ago, Nino Scherter, uh, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, greatest mountain biker of all time. Uh, he was at Nova Mesto and Tom Pigcock was having a, admittedly, as he said, a rough day. And I think Nino knew that. And he was looking really good. 
and he could finally get that one more victory than Julian Absalon and be like, it'd be really tough to then argue that he's not the greatest of all time. He really wants to win this one more world cup before he retires, whenever that may be to be able to have more than everybody else. It was looking so fantastic and, and promising. And then he got a flat tire and it brought him back, I think a minute or two off the lead group. And when he pulled in to get the flat, I was, I had, I was exhibiting more anxiety than he was when he had stopped <laughs> to get that flat. He pulled up to his team. He like grabbed two bottles, was drinking casually sitting there. He even like patted one of his team members on the back, like, and he was so completely calm. And it was very clear to me that he had thought through this exact occurrence. When this happens, this is what I'm going to do. And then he got back on the bike and had it. You need to watch it. An absolutely heroic effort. Chad, I, you're nodding your head. I'm sure you saw it too. It was so fun to watch, mm -hmm. but he was a great example of bad things happening. And instead of letting it in a truly high consequence time, when he had the opportunity to beat Tom Pickcock on a rough day and get that like absolute record, right. Of having the most world cup wins yet. He reacted so calmly. So there's a lot to that visualization thing, like you're saying, and finding your own process through it so that it isn't a detrimental, uh, it doesn't have a detrimental effect. And instead it has an enabling effect. Right. It kind of sounds like what you did was you got to a point where you were not only practicing how you would respond in the moment, but you were also practicing going through a bad situation or circumstance and coming out the other side and being okay. Yes. So you were pra practicing being okay on the other side of something going wrong. And somebody like Nino has had a long enough career that that has happened both in visualization and in real life, right? Mm -hmm. So he's had lots of practice where like, yeah, this has happened before and it's disappointing. It's not what I wanted on the day, but I've been through this enough times to know that I'm gonna be okay. It's gonna be you okay. Can, you can see through it. You can almost attain the mental state of the aftermath prior to it. So, right. so you go exactly. into it knowing I'm going to come out of it feeling this way later in the day, I'm going to feel this way. I can feel this way. Now I can allow myself to dial it back, relax a bit, feel this way. Now, feel this way now, knowing that the outcome is going to be a safe one, something I can, I can trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well that said. visualization is great because you can practice so many things in a very non-threatening, low stress environment. Um, so a wonderful thing, a great tool to incorporate in your pre-race plan. So let's talk about during the race. And this is a little bit, the during the race plan is something you want to think about before the race. So part of your <laughs> pre-race plan should be making a plan for that you want to execute during the race. Attack and some from the that, gun and think on the fly, Amber. That's <laughs> figure it out. Cross the finish line first. It's really <laughs> basic, you guys. <laughs> no, it's not basic. Um, and, and I want to step back a second. I just saw a question in the live chat asking like, how do you have time to do all of this prep? Well, you don't have to do all of these things. You can pick the ones that resonate with you and you don't have to do them all at one time. You can spend a half an hour here and there, take at 30 minutes to check out the course file on, on Google maps, have that, you know, maybe in a folder on your, on your computer, come back later, do a, do a, a run through on what you think that your nutrition should look like. It doesn't have to happen all at once. And you don't have to do everything that we're saying. It's just pick the pieces that are going to be most meaningful for where you are right now. So during the race, there's a lot of things that you can incorporate into a strategy. Um, again, you want to have a balance of some things that are absolutely within your control. So for the most part, your nutrition will be within your control. What are you eating and drinking? There's always a chance that you might lose a bottle. Something might fall out of your pocket, but in general, your nutrition is within your control. So that's a great thing to incorporate into a race plan that you want to execute on race day, because that's one of those boxes that you're most likely going to be able to tick as a, that was a win. I set that goal and I nailed it. Um, other goals that you can set during a race would be skills-based goals. So what are some skills that you want to work on? Maybe that's pulling your water bo bottle out in a group to drink and putting it back and getting more comfortable with that. Maybe it's getting more comfortable moving through a group and positioning. That's road racing. There might be something that you want to work on in terms of mountain biking. Maybe it's specifically, a, you know, I really want to work on how I'm weighting myself on the bike up a really steep incline, or I really want to work on how I'm taking these berms on a descent. You can identify specific things that you want to work on. And if you're working on skills during your race, I really recommend when you're talking about a race plan that you want to execute, keep it simple. Don't try to work on 30 things, pick one. 
pick one thing and a couple of things within your control. So skills are great ones. Um, selection points can be great mid-race goals. So if you know that there's going to be a really big climb that might be a selection point, a good process goal would be, I want to be in the top five riders, let's say in a road race, uh, when we get to the bottom of that climb. So my goal, a process goal, part of my race plan is be in good position when we get to the base of that climb. In a mountain bike race, it might be different. Um, it might be trying to get the whole shot. It might be <laughs> mm -hmm. something else, but depending on the discipline, you can have these inter race, you know, within the race goals, um, that are somewhat within your control. They might not be entirely within your control because you can't con control what other athletes are going to do, what the weather is going to be. Um, but those are some really good ones. Pacing mm -hmm. is a good one. So this is maybe a little bit less, rel you know, pacing comes into play in a road race. Maybe you don't want to get pulled out of your climbing pace too early in the race. So you're going to be conservative and you're going to maybe let an attack go on the climb, knowing that there's a long stretch after that, where you can probably come back. Um, pacing in a mountain bike race, pacing in a gravel race, stick to your placing pacing plan. That can be part of your race execution plan. Yeah. Jonathan. This is exemplified by a number of pro athletes that uh, pro mountain bikers, Kate Courtney, uh, Sophia, Hannah, Keegan, so lots of pro as Sevilla, like they do what you're talking about very often as a way to be able to manage <clears throat> selection points and pacing. They kind of do wrap both of them into one in mountain biking mm -hmm. in particular because positioning is so important and you can find yourself just simply by rel you know, by cause of your position in the field, two minutes behind a leader. And, and thusly you can never have a chance at moving up toward the front of that group. So mm -hmm. what they'll do is they'll just say, my goal for this race, the only thing I'm focused on right now is by lap one, I need to be in the top 40 by lap two or by this climb or by some other landmark. I just need to make it up within the top 20 or I need to hold that rider's wheel. And they'll do that instead of looking at things like I need to hold power or I need to do something else because the race, like you said, is out of your control. And mm -hmm. the, there's, there's kind of like a nice thing where if you can say by lap or by this landmark, I need to be here. And by this landmark, I need to be here. I'm one of the riders that really struggles with like just racing in the moment and, and letting go of this end goal. And instead, what I'll do is I'll think of every single decision that I'm doing during the race, and I'll be weighing it, weighing it against the consequence of how that's going to impact the end outcome. And while that is really important in some cases, like a time trial, for example, it's, it's really important. But at the same time, when you're racing other people, sometimes you have to simply race other people. Mm -hmm. And it's really helpful and liberating to have those just little landmark goals that allow you to disconnect from this perhaps even anxiety and pressure inducing end race outcome goal that you have on your mind. Now, yeah. I'm glad this came up because you talk about racing other people. And I think in the past, I've, I've always, always described this as a situation where I don't really have any say in the matter. I either have the fitness or I don't, but I go with those people until I blow up and they dictate my strategy, my pacing. And that's not true. It doesn't have to be true at all. And this kind of, I don't want to jump ahead, but this brings us to racing your own race, just because mm -hmm. the pace is what is, was it, what it is with the leaders. If you haven't got that, you pace differently. You in fact, race your own race. And often enough, it comes back together and it ends up working out for you anyway. But just because you aren't the fittest racer out there or the most motivated one on the day, doesn't mean you necessarily have to race someone else's race. You're still right. in charge of your pacing and that strategy can pay off. Mm -hmm. mm. Exactly. And you have to be a little bit flexible with it, but yeah, you need to be able to respond to the others in the race, but how you respond is your decision and can be influenced by the plan that you have in place. So a really simple example is let's say you're setting up a race plan for a criterium. You might in your race plan say, I'm not going with any attacks in the first half of the race, because typically in this race, those don't stick. So, and I'm really, really struggling with being patient. So today I'm going to work on being patient and I'm not going to go with any attacks in the first half of the race. I can go as soon as, as soon as we hit the halfway point, I can go, but I'm not going to allow myself to do that. And I know that by setting that goal, I might miss the winning break, but I'm willing to do that because this is something that I need to work on. And so people are going to be attacking in the first half of the race and sticking to your race plan would be okay. Today I'm working on this thing. 
So that's my focus. That's my commitment. That's my goal. And that's what's going to influence the decision and how I respond to those people. Um, and we're going to get deeper into how you stick to a race plan, but that's a super good point, Chad. Um, other things that you can incorporate into a race plan. And again, you really want your during race plan to be simple because there is going to be a lot going on. You're going to be processing a lot of information. It's very dynamic. Um, so keeping it simple so that you can stay present in the race, like Jonathan said, is really, really helpful. But another thing that you can incorporate is strategy. So talking just that example right there, are you racing for a breakaway? Are you hoping for a bunch sprint, um, in a road race, in a gravel race, it might be different. That strategy might be, Hey, I'm going to try to stick with this person as long as I can, or I'm going to be, you know, somewhat conservative until this point, And then I'm really going to unleash and not hold back or. This is where I want to plan my attack. Um, same thing with mountain bike racing. Cyclocross is a little bit different too. Every discipline has its own strategies, but your strategy would be part of that race plan. And your strategy is always going to depend on what other people are doing, as we just said. So you're racing other people. So this is one of those components of your race plan, which you need to hold a little bit loosely because people may not do what you expect them to do. And you may have to pivot your strategy on the fly. You might be gunning for a breakaway. It might be the fact that in this race, a breakaway has won every year for the last 10 years. And today is the day that it finishes in a bunch sprint. And you're going to have to deal with that and, and just pivot on the fly. So again, when you have your race plan, know ahead of time, this is something I can control. This is something that I may need to adapt on the fly. And we talked about nutrition and hydration. So you've got your pre-race plan. You've got your, your race execution plan now how do you stick to that on race day? And we've just addressed a couple of strategies there where you're identifying areas where you want to stay within your pace and you don't want to be drawn out of a pace that isn't, you know, drawn into a pace that's not comfortable for you, even though you're trying to respond to those athletes. So to what degree are you going to respond to your competitors? Um, and, and hope, making sure that you're not getting pulled out too far from what your pacing strategy is or what your strengths are on race day. Um, what are some strategies you guys have to stick to a race plan when you have, when you've got one in place? Oh, it's hard, right? Chad, like <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> uh, when like a rider's attacking and you're like, oh, that's absolutely the move. I need to go with that. I'm going to miss it. Like it's really easy to convince yourself that everything is the race winning move and you're missing everything. Mm -hmm. It's easy to mm -hmm. fall into oh, that wow. trap for me at least. Well, I like what yeah. Amber mentioned with historically this race has done this. So I have to be part of whatever that may be. But I remember my first time going to it was called McLean Pacific and it got renamed, help me out, Merco, Merco, Merco yeah, Sageries. And the, they said that, you know, this breakaways don't stick. Don't waste your time in a breakaway. It's not going to stick. But, you know, my plan I actually had a bit of a plan was to wait till later in the race. <laughs> it's pretty nebulous, but later in the race, and then I'm going to go with the breakaway. I don't care. I think we can make it work. I'm, I'm strong. Bub is strong that the riders on my team were strong. Either way, I had faith in the fact that we could break this trend and we did. So, so my plan totally flew in the face of what history said, but it ended mm -hmm. up paying off and it showed me right then and there, I, mean, I don't have to adhere to anyone's advice if I strongly feel otherwise. And, you know, you, you get more fortified in that belief as you race more and succeed more. But if that had failed, it probably would have shaped my <laughs> views a bit differently, but it turns <laughs> out that, that it worked out. You have to know yourself like as an athlete to be able to stick to that plan and knowing yourself is akin to having confidence in yourself and your abilities. And that comes with experience. I, I mm -hmm. don't think that any rider that doesn't have experience. So we, we actually have like a comment in the live chat right now from Chris saying, relating to this a ton crushed my race plan, but still got 17th in the stage race. I did all the prep in the world doesn't fix not being strong enough. And this is a really good point to bring up right here. Because you'll sometimes, okay, I'll speak for myself. I've built race plans that are absolutely unrealistic for my capabilities. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that I may be putting pressure on myself to follow this race plan and to stick to this plan when it's a bad plan. It's not the right plan <laughs> because it's above my capabilities and so far above that it's not like I can approach it with curiosity and explore something else. It's like me going up against Brandon on a hill climb time trial. It ain't going to end well, right? Like, like it's just not going to happen. So, um, it, I think that there's a balance. You need to have a realistic plan, but then when you're talking about sticking to a race plan, honestly, Amber, I think that the, it becomes easier to stick to when it's more clear mm -hmm. and it, when it has like really easy action. 
if it's like Chad mentioned the nebulous aspect of the end, like I'm just going to go with something late. If you can give yourself even something a bit more specific on that and be like, uh, at the end of the race, I actually expect this rider to go when that rider goes at the end of the race, I'm going with them. Mm -hmm. Or if it's something like at five K to go, I know I can put out an effort that would equal the same duration that we'll have at five K to go. That would be very hard to stick with keeping my powder dry until then. It's like having a very specific move. And Chad has mentioned this many times. Don't put the pressure on yourself to win every race or to have some sort of results or outcome that needs to happen. Instead, set these goals that are really specific in a race and then go out and execute those. And that makes it, I think, once again, easier to stick to a race plan because you mm -hmm. have a track record of doing it and you know how to do it. So then at that point, moving forward, you're like, hey, this one, this race, I actually do have a chance to win. I know I've executed and been able to have the self, have the self control in the middle of the race to do this before. So I have confidence that I can do it now. So yeah. kind of like even just practicing setting realistic goals and then accomplishing them, even if it doesn't mean winning the race is a really good way to be able to make this more feasible when the consequences are in place for a win. And I'd like totally. to <clears throat> caution yeah. against not having a race plan too, because you can play it fast and loose, especially if you're <laughs> in lower categories, especially if you're either amongst the strongest rider or maybe the strongest rider. And I had the luxury of being that rider for a little while. So I thought, I don't need a plan. I'm just going to go out there and ride hard and ride people off my wheel and chase things down and attack and attack and attack until it works out. And often enough it did, but then I go into, you know, I, I, I cat up and, I, and I'm put in races where not having a plan was a severe penalty. Mm -hmm. I just, I had no results for a good long while until I started recognizing the value in planning <laughs> and in, in nutritional planning is still a, a challenge to me. Something that as I get more and more right, I perform better imagine <laughs> who knew, <laughs> but yeah, but, but with the strategy and, and as, again, as you move through the categories and you start becoming parts of teams and, and the, the team strategies start to fold into it and you can't play it fast and loose. It's a hard lesson or a slower lesson to learn than accepting early in the early stages. If I start planning now, I can benefit from knowing how to plan, knowing where plans kind of, kind of break down where you get that proverbial punch in the face and you have to just wing it from that point. But just understand from the onset or the outset, I guess it is planning is important. Having a race plan matters. Totally. I love that. And Jonathan, you said something I think is really important, which is to know yourself as an athlete and knowing yourself as an athlete, isn't something that just happens. Like you don't just wake up one morning and know calculus. Like it's not going to happen. You have I tried to that. learn. <laughs> <Didn't work well. laughs> so learning about yourself as an athlete is really what we're looking for here. And at some point you might think, you know, yourself and trust me, as you get older and more experience under your belt, like you as an athlete, you will also change. So what worked for you or for sure, what worked for me five years ago, isn't working necessarily the same way that it used to for me now. So this is a, this is an ever evolving process, but the better that you can know yourself, the more you can learn about yourself, the better you'll be able to put together these race plans. You'll know what playlist works for you. You'll know, yeah. um, what your specific kind of mental and psychological traps are and how to avoid them you will learn. And so if you put this into that lens of learning and your plan is part of learning how, how you work as an athlete and what works for you as an athlete, that's one way of approaching this that can really help. And so like Jonathan said, um, you may not know that you're making a plan that isn't going to work for you, or that's maybe a little bit too aspirational for where you are right now. That's okay. You try it and you learn something from it, and then you can apply that the next time that you put together a race plan. And the important thing is that you take those takeaways and apply them again in the future so that as you make mistakes, which you absolutely will, because that's how we learn, you just don't make the same one twice. And trust me, there are lots of ways that you can make mistakes. Yeah. You'll never run out. Um, <laughs> but it's important that you, you really, the goal is to learn from those. It's not to avoid them, it's to learn from those. And so, you know, a couple ways, just some basic strategies for sticking to a race plan is to decide ahead of time, what are the things and when would you be willing to change your plan? So maybe, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be changing my plan on nutrition unless something catastrophic happens, like I lose a bottle or stuff falls out of my pocket. Like that one, 
is rock solid. I'm hitting that, that no matter what. And I'm going to commit to never letting this rider go up the road without me or not doing any attacks in the first half of the race or being conservative on this climb and really hitting this other one hard. D you know, you can make a few commitments and then know ahead of time that, yeah, I would really like this to come down to a field sprint, but I'm willing to let that go if I, you know, if there's a good opportunity for a breakaway or I really want to get into a breakaway, but I'm willing to let that go if it comes down to a field sprint and this is how I would handle that situation. So if you kind of have in mind ahead of time, like what are the things that you can, you're willing to change and the things that you're not, it can really help on race day when things are not going to plan and it's like, oh shoot, well, do I need to change my nutrition strategy? Nope. You've already made that decision. That one's not changing, but eh, I could maybe go for a breakaway instead of a sprint today because it looks like that's the way the wind is blowing. So that can really help. Um, what it looks like when you don't stick to a race plan, I thought that was worth maybe touching on briefly. And we've, we've talked about that already. That's often responding to the race dynamics in a way where you've committed to not going with any attacks in the first half of the race. And now you've just set, found yourself following the sixth one and you're only 10 minutes into the race. Like it's not sticking to your race plan. Never, never been guilty of that one. <laughs> <laughs> and racing is fun and it's exciting. So sometimes it's really hard to just like rein it in. And I think probably one of the hardest things to learn is how to be patient and when to be patient. Um, so that's a great mm -hmm. one to work on in a race plan. But um, making sure that as you do respond to the race as it unfolds, which you can't predict, that you are still hanging on to some of those tent stakes that you've established before the race started in terms of your race plan. Um, and then what does it look like to ride your own race? We've talked about that a little bit. It's different for mountain bike versus road versus gravel versus cyclocross. But the important thing is that you do have a plan and that in so much as you possibly can, given the circumstances and the race dynamics, you do try to stick to it. And then the last thing I want to talk about, and I love to hear from you guys on this one too, is, um, the comment about getting stuck in your head. Cause I think we've all been there, right? You have a plan, you've done your homework, you feel really good about it. You feel really confident. You get into the race and nothing is going the way that you thought it would. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yeah, I, this is. So there, there is a time to like, as they say, like cut bait, right. And to change. <laughs> but I'd almost encourage people to not do that for a while. If this is, if you're building experience, um, or even if you haven't been racing for a long time, like if Chad got back into crit racing right now, he hasn't done crit race. He hasn't raced a crit in a really long time. Chad would probably have an adaptation period. I, I mean, it would probably be really short because I've seen him jump into crits <laughs> after like a long time off and he still races so well. And I had, but... a, and I had a cram for crits. Yeah. <laughs> We're actually going to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to it. It's, yeah. So I, I just, um, I think that there's, there is a time to cut bait. Don't get me wrong. Especially if it's like this race matters and you need to like the result matters of the race. And I think that we should put our efforts, our focus, instead of on the results, we should put it on the learning and the process of the race much more mm -hmm. often than the result. Uh, C races, they may be low prioritized and, uh, but many times we race a C race, like it's an A race when really we should be using it as a learning experience instead of trying or to try something new. So in my mind, when things are unfolding exactly how I wasn't expecting them many times, that's because other athletes in that field don't have a plan either. And they're all just going <laughs> crazy and it's all chaotic. But if you stick to your plan, you might actually have something that's a bit more solid and calculated than anybody else. So there's, there's look, if there's no consequence to the result, stick to your plan and try it and see if it works. And it'll probably teach you something that's going to inform your next race plan. And mm -hmm. over and over, you'll get to the point where you start to build up this library of experience and confidence in your own ability to choose and act. I, I mean, Wout van Aert and, and forgive me for the pronunciations and Matthew Vanderpool, both of them, they have like a Royal flush in terms of everything that you need to be a great bike racer. Right. So I don't <laughs> yeah. tend to, uh, overstate their execution over their genetics or over all of the hard work that they do in training or anything else. But I wonder if their ability to find success in races that you just don't expect them to find success in and mm -hmm. to find it in unlikely, likely circumstances is because of how much experience they have in racing. Since, I mean, if you look at Matthew Vanderpool, when he was a tiny little kid, like five years old, he's doing cyclocross races and, and he's like racing kids that are older than him. 
And he's doing this all the time. Not, we're not talking every weekend. He was doing it during the week. He was doing it all the time. And he's been doing mountain bike races like that and road races. I mean, he may have raced more than athletes that are retiring from the pro Peloton now, and they're relatively (laughs) new to it. So I wonder how much of their ability to find success is because they've done what we're talking about here, had a plan stuck with it and learned had a plan Mm -hmm. stuck with it and learned. And then when you just multiply that by all the different races they've done, it makes you a really good racer. The cyclist part, clearly they take care of too. They're very good with their training and with their genetics and everything else, but they're just, uh, they stand out as the best racers I've seen. Even an athlete like Vincenzo Nibali is a great example of that too. A racer that finds ways to make things happen. And I bet it's from doing, following Amber's advice here, getting a plan and sticking to it. So. Mm -hmm. I think a key here is getting stuck in your head too can happen when things aren't going to plan. You can go into the space where, um, you just go into like a very negative mental state too, right? It's like, this isn't, dang, this isn't what I wanted. What am I supposed to do now? And it's really hard when you start, when your brain latches on to some mm-hmm. negative thoughts, you know, mm-hmm. oh, man, I was really going for a breakaway and it's clearly not going to happen. You know, I might as well give up or what am I even doing here? Or I can't sprint. Yes. So I might as well just pull out right now. And that's really hard to pull back from. It and spirals. so I think that it spirals. Yeah. And one of the hardest things to train in general is focus straight up. Um, being very good at positioning in a, in a field, in a road race is all about focus. It's, it's not, and it's not, I'll tell you one thing, no one can focus hundred percent of the time, but the best in the world at positioning in a bike race are the people who have the fewest, um, who break focus the least. Right. So it's not mm-hmm. about having hundred percent focus. It's, it's how long, how, how quickly can you bring your focus back to something that's relevant, meaningful, and productive, and hopefully also positive. So learning how to recognize when your focus has strayed to something that's not helping you. And instead of doubling down on that and saying, oh man, there I go again. My focus is on something unproductive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't judge it. Don't berate yourself for your focus. Just say, oh, there I go again. Let's come back to process goal, which was, I want to, you know, process goal, which was, I want to move past two handlebars at a time. So I'm going to move past two sets of handlebars forward in the group. And I'm going to try to do that again until I get distracted again. And I'm just going to bring my focus back or redirecting your focus to, ah, man, I really got shuffled back to the back of the Peloton. I was hoping to be in this better position for the selection point. It didn't happen. What's my next process goal? What's the next goal on my list? Or this is maybe a time I need to grab some food and make sure that I'm nailing my nutrition if you know I didn't hit that mark. Um, but can you step back instead of contributing to the downward spiral by getting down on yourself about where your head is and then just take a beat and say, whoop, there I go again, even laugh about it to yourself. And then what can I redirect my focus to that's going to be productive and helpful right now? Mm -hmm. Bike racing more than anything in my life has taught me that it's never over till it's over. There, there there's so many situations where the circumstances are not what I wanted them to be, where they look downright dire. There's just no way of reclaiming this but I'm still going to finish the bike race. And in doing so, I'm still going to try as hard as I can the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, it, don't, don't quit bike races. Cause we've talked about it before. It only gets easier. <laughs> don't get in your head just because everything's not going perfectly from the, from the, from the starting gun. It's the, the it sounds cliche and super pithy and trite, but you never give up. You just keep yeah. on trying because it, it, it's amazing how much a race can turn around in the span of a very short period of time. And, yeah. and if you, you if you really start to get in your head, you just have to move past those distractions. Just to what Amber was saying just now, just just don't get stuck in your head. Get get back out of your head. Focus on just anything, just any form of improvement, or just not being down on yourself. Just okay, fine. I'm just going to race my bike. No no outcome mm-hmm. goals, no process goals. I'm just going to race my bike. Come what may, but I'm not going to quit. Yeah. This is, it took me a really long time to figure out what Amber just laid out. And it's funny. I went back to find my notes when I dealt with it, like, uh, it was actually after national championships, geez, in 2019, maybe. And I was disillusioned because I had a result in my mind that I was capable of, and I wasn't even close to it. And I remember sitting down and thinking about 
that and breaking down why am I feeling this dissonance and why it like, what did I do to set myself up for this? And uh, what I ended up coming to for me personally, this is how like uh, it makes sense to me is that I had a result that was a goal and I was putting everything on that result and it was an unrealistic one. And as a result, I replaced confidence with hope. Mm -hmm. So like my confidence was gone and instead I was purely racing on hope. And while hoping for a good result is, is a good thing, I actually try my best whenever I find myself saying, I hope so, or I hope that's the case. I stop and go remove hope. And it's actually something we do a lot here at work is we try to remove the word hopefully from our dialogues. And instead we replace that and think about what we need to do to replace that. And every time we do that, you go back to the basics of what you have done before, what you know you can execute on, what you have evidence of executing on, and you stick to those things. And based off those, what should the outcome be? So even mid-race, when everything goes sideways and you get in your head like we're talking about, and if you're disillusioned and feeling desperate to be able to get a result and you feel like it's slipped away and everything has changed, go back to what you know you can do well. What are you really good at? Is it being able to move up past riders and technical sections? Is it being able to pull really hard on the flats and being able to then put those smaller riders that might just hurt you on the climbs in a whole bit of bother, right? So <laughs> yeah. like, think of this and think about what you're good at and just start executing on what you're good at. Like if everything truly does go out the window and you're stuck in your head, start executing at what you're good at. And then what happens is even throughout mid race, you've done one thing and you can go, Hey, I did it. Awesome job. Do it again. And then do it again and build on it, build on it. And suddenly you've reinforced confidence that, Hey, I, I do belong out here. This is me yeah. being a bike racer and executing like I know how to race because it's really easy to convince yourself otherwise. And what ends up happening is you get to a point where that's how you end up executing and fulfilling your potential because you're executing on what you know you can do and you're doing it well and you're doing it repeatedly. So I've had to focus on that multiple races where, man, I'm not at the front. Like I thought I was going to be, well, what do I do now? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, you're really good at moving up in this section. So focus on doing that every lap, just move up, just move up. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Or you're really good at even eating and making sure that you're nailing that. Just focus on that. Like there's a lot of different things, but break it down to the things that you can do and just do those well to rebuild confidence. I love that. Yeah. You know, anytime somebody has won a race, the way that they did that was at some point they put themselves in a position to win and mm -hmm. really if you want to win a race and we'll just take that as an example, but it could be any outcome goal. If you want to win a race or whatever the outcome goal is, you have to put yourself in a position to do that. And really putting yourself in a position to do it is the one thing that, that may or that, that might be in your control. Cause you're not going to control the outcome unless you control putting yourself in a position to achieve the outcome. And so when mm -hmm. you focus on the smaller things, it's kind of like if I nail my workout today, great. If I nail my workout tomorrow, great. Pretty soon I have a week of nailed workouts and then that turns into a month and then that turns into a season. And by executing on the smaller steps, I put myself in a position to have a much higher level of fitness. And it's the same thing in a race. You put yourself in a position to make the first selection. You put yourself in a position to make the second selection. You've nailed your, your nutrition. You've stuck with a strategy and a race plan. You've been reading the race and responding. You put yourself in a position to win and you may or may not win because somebody might be stronger, faster, a little bit smarter on the day and kudos to them. But part of what we're doing here with the, the, the race plans and sticking to your race plan is to learn about yourself in, as an athlete and to learn how to put yourself in a position to achieve the goals that you want to, that you want to achieve. Well said, well said. Thanks, Amber. That was a great yep. walkthrough. Hopefully that gave <laughs> our guys. athletes. Yeah. Gave our athletes ever a lot of uh, useful tips to be able to execute for the races. The live chat's fantastic today, by the way, uh, <laughs> mentioned within this was which roller dog is most effective fuel for VO2 max workouts, <laughs> a meta analysis. <laughs> and when we were discussing I'll volunteer stopping, for that study <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> when discussing stopping mid rides and having a hot dog and how that could affect VO2 max output, then then uh, mustard as a replacement for sealant was discussed. Plenty of good stuff. So this is the sort of stuff that you miss if you're not in the live chat. Go do it. Uh, <laughs> Brendan says, what is the recommended minimum amount of rides per week I need to be at for Trainer Road to be, quote, worth it? 
Due to life, I currently am only able to ride two days a week consistently. I used to ride four to five times a week, but life has been overwhelming recently. Also triathlon training with two swims uh, per week and three runs per week and two strength training per week. Brendan, you're doing a lot. Um, yeah. Well done on prioritizing the, the sort of stuff that makes you happy and makes you healthy amidst busy life. I think that everybody mm-hmm. could use a bit of a pat on the back because it's not <laughs> easy to do that stuff. Um, so well done, Brendan. Uh, okay. I guess, Chad, do you want to go into this one? Cause I mean, the first thing I look at that trainer road to be worth it. I don't think that it's limited to like, there isn't like a single day where it's like, if you can train this amount of days, it's worth it. So we have train now. That's why the low volume plans exist at three. And in this case, Brandon can't do that. I think train now would be a good, ex- a good example of what to do in this case. But what do you think, Chad? Uh, where do you want to start with this one? Yeah, well, very much in line with that this is a recurrent question and and concern and rightly so. So I want to briefly restate a couple of key points that we've talked about in at least a podcast each, probably more. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that producers, someone behind the scene can steer people to those exact episodes. But first improvement can come from anything that's above and beyond that to which you're accustomed. Right. So, I mean, you could be completely deconditioned on the couch and do a workout a week and it would yield enough stimulus to, to provoke adaptation to actually make you a little bit faster. So, so it's relative, obviously always contextual. And then secondly, maintenance demands pale in comparison to the demands we place on ourselves when we're trying to establish that fitness in the first place. So I'm not sure if your situation is one where you'd consider maintenance, where you just need to work past this very busy period of time, but maintenance can be just a little bit of work in, in, in key areas. And again, we've dedicated podcasts and at least discussions within several podcasts to each of those topics. Mm -hmm. So what's ahead is, is my effort to bring something kind of newish to the discussion. I'm sure there's going to be things we've discussed before, but probably not in this particular light. And I want to kick it off with just a reminder that adaptation comes about as a response to certain signals. And these are the terms we're, we're going to use quite a lot today. Um, and we, we just talked about this, how, how, signaling by adjusting your recovery duration and recovery intensity changes a bit, right? Things, things get different by manipulating one of these variables. So here I want to talk about affecting signaling by focusing on the work intervals, you know, the other side Mm -hmm. of that particular band, specifically by altering the usual suspects, you know, intensity, frequency, and duration. But also I want to make an early honorable mention to the importance of nutrition, obviously, both its timing and its composition, but in the context of signaling adaptation. And I'll kick this off. Amber's talked about this a lot. I'm going to let her her close this, but I'll kick this off with a study by Hughes from a few years back that offers a simple, very important observation. They related it to both endurance training and strength training and talked about how identifying quote, potential candidate molecules end quote, the signal adaptation is only really of consequence when we understand how that signaling interacts with, amongst other things, our response to feeding. So when we see these magic molecules, the, the PGC1 alphas, the AMPKs, the MAPKs, the calcium chymodulase, the ABCDFG, all these things, they can often distract from how they're just part of the picture, right? The, the paper mentions how adaptive signaling boils down to exercise and nutrition. And I like the Mm -hmm. simplicity of that because I think it's something that's easy to see in the context or the realm of strength training, but I think it's easy for us to forget in the context of endurance training, fuel the work. Sure. We talk about it all the time, but to promote the adaptive signaling via timing, composition, quantity, quality of our diets is just not as frequently discussed. The point being is that the most impactful signals we send are due to a combination of nutrition and exercise, not just exercise. And that food provides more than just fuel, but also Mm -hmm. these important signals, signals that are actually vital to the adaptation we're chasing. So even a blaring exercise stimulus doesn't mean a heck of a lot if our nourishment doesn't, two things, support the work and promote the desired signaling. And and I- so true. it, It is. And I mentioned this- also to shift attention away from what we've kind of talked about with process and outcome goals is focus on the things that you can optimize less on the things that you can't optimize and, and optimization may never be achieved, but we can always move towards optimal nutrition is one of those things in the signaling realm. It's so true. Yeah. And, and a lot of the, I mean, there's so much here for research to still uncover, uh, uncover, mm. discover, and understand it's, it's amazing. Um, but really nutrition, it, it is not just about calories in, calories out. It's about signaling 
to your, your body, your brain, your confidence, your RPE, how you feel, your mood, all of those things can help you optimize your training. And your body is constantly taking in these various inputs, right? The training stress, the nutrition, other stress in life, your moods, your interactions, and it's making decisions about how to optimize based on all of those constraints. So your body can only do the best. Your body is always doing the best it can for you. It's always trying to help, <laughs> but it can only do what it can within the current constraints that you impose on it. Right? So let's remove some of those constraints and give your body as many degrees of freedom as possible when it comes to your training. So give your body all of the nutrition it needs so that it isn't compromising the training adaptations because it isn't getting enough fuel or it isn't getting enough of the signaling that it needs to initiate those those adaptation cascades and get you the outcomes that you want and the outcomes that you know you you expect and you hope for based on all the work that you're putting in perfect perfectly said <laughs> Okay. I have nothing to so, add. So <laughs> I, I knew she would have something to contribute. I mean, I bring this up because she's talked about it so many times and we never really elaborate on it. So, so here's that mm. opportunity to Love do it. so. <laughs> so let's get back to, to being limited by duration and frequency, because that's basically what Brendan's describing here. And what does that leave, but intensity it's, it's really only one of a small handful of these key workout variables that's still at his disposal. What else is left? And this is almost an offshoot of frequency, depending on how you want to look at it, but consistency. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's not only how frequently you train, but it's how frequently you maintain or reinforce this all important signaling consistently, right? And you, Brendan, you can't work out a lot, but you can work out two times a week. And this affords you two times a week, every week to reinforce your adaptive signaling, to send the right messages and do it on a reliable schedule. And in doing so, not only maintain your fitness, but even elevate it by maximizing at least one of these key variables. What a great perspective, Chad. Yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah, that. Thank you. And this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm teeing myself up here because this is bringing me to another option that I think too often flies under the radar of endurance athletes and it's sprint intensity training. It's, mm. it's just a consideration. I want people to mull over because unless you're doing it right now, sprinting, you know, all out 30 second efforts offer a novel stimulus with endurance performance outcomes. And it's important to clarify, I'm, I'm not suggesting novelty for the sake of novelty. I, I believe that doing that just introduces noise into the signal. It actually detracts from the consistency we're after here. Rather, sprint intensity training or SIT is a potentially hugely impactful novelty that most riders just don't consider because it's counter to what you'd expect. My suggestion is think about dedicating yourself to even two weeks, but ideally I'd like to see more like four, six, you can go longer of this sprint intensity training because most of the research interventions consist of, or not because, but also most of these interventions consist of two times a week, because first off it's very potent stuff. And not only that, but sit is the epitome of time efficient training. And he, uh, Brendan said he can train twice a week. I'm assuming he's only got brief periods of time to train twice a week. We're not talking about four and five hour days. So time efficiency is probably a concern on top of that. It's a form of training that can be inserted for brief periods and still yield these significant physiological benefits. And for anybody who's curious and wants to jump ahead, just go to our workouts page and click the zone sprint. And then within that check the box, max efforts, and you'll see workouts that are describing or that are exactly what I'm describing. And I do want to add, this is a recommendation based on plenty of anecdotes total data, my own, I use these, this is how I cram for crit season, how I'm fast for those early races, <laughs> even though I haven't been on the bike very much. And then of course I hide a lot and then <laughs> empirical data, because I've coached a lot of clients and we've had little sprint, sprint intensity interim, uh, just, just a couple of weeks to break things up or to achieve a particular type of fitness rapidly. Corey, our support director, I want to say mm -hmm. actually yeah. did this to good effect and mm -hmm. surprise, surprise there's research. And we're going to talk about some of the research, just a couple papers. First is John Hawley and colleagues just a few years ago, 2018 points out that muscle adaptation to endurance exercise comes in response to greater meta metabolic load. So higher rates of energy turnover. And then their words, extreme perturbations in cell homeostasis. So basically disruptions at the muscle. So to put it another way, it's how quickly can we make and break ATP or energy and how deeply can we disrupt the muscle cells? You know, how strongly can we send those adaptation generating signals? 
and the paper points to all our options, you know, long, slow distance, which is obviously about volume more than anything, high intensity interval training, something we're very familiar with and sprint <laughs> intensity training. And it serves as this paper serves as yet another reminder of sits potency and effectiveness in the aerobic realm. It consistently improves endurance capacity. And this is totally counter to everything that's intuitive. It's well-documented. It's well-supported. And I'll close this with an example of that, which though just one example, it is a systematic review and meta-analysis by GIST in 2013 that included 16 randomized trials, 318 participants, and they range from sedentary to recreational to trained. And all of them demonstrated that 30 second all out efforts led to significant improvements in muscle, muscle oxidative capacity. So basically our muscles, aerobic capacity or capabilities, max O2 uptake, VO2 max, and just in general endurance performance, not to mention the positive impact on cardiorespiratory fitness, which of course has nice. just broader, farther reaching, further reaching uh, health implications. With regards to the VO2 max improvements, the aggregate improvement across this meta was 8%. And this is, this is when they related it to the no exercise controls. So did mm. this in, in, instead of not exercising, 8% bump. And then they saw similar improvements in VO2 max when they compared it to similar uh, to moderate to vigorous intensity endurance exercise. Of course, they're achieving it in way less time. I mean, way less sure. time. These are very short workouts and we're talking a couple of times a week. So the point being is something, some you know, the, a form of exercise that's seemingly alactic or an, anaerobic and done with relatively long recovery durations improve the opposite end of the metabolic spectrum. And it's just more evidence that there are so many ways to skin that aerobic capacity cat. And, and one way that can be or done cat. with very, very little weekly time. And as a, as a very short training excursion, one of the, in, back in that GIST review, they ranged everywhere from two week to 10 week interventions and Bailey in particular, just two weeks, Martin Jabala, who's a big proponent of this form of training who came later, or was probably doing studies at the time, but his research surfaced later, used only six sessions over two weeks. So they did three sessions per week, two weeks and achieved again, significant improvements in aerobic capacity, VO2 max and endurance performance. Admittedly, this is tough stuff. It's physically challenging. It's psychologically challenging. It's at times gastrically challenging. And it's a tough act to balance with high intensity training for sure. But I question whether even moderate intensity training weaves into this too well. So I would highly recommend countering this with low intensity training should you find yourself with more time to ride. I hesitate, but I'm going to go on record and coin this as a extreme polarization because that's what we're talking about. We're mm -hmm. talking about working at both ends of the spectrum because I think it's probably best to keep your training in this case, very intense or really, really easy, at least initially. And you, you can feel it out, but, but start conservatively. And to be clear, Chad's talking about the context of doing this as your only training. There are mm -hmm. the vast majority of athletes that we're talking to here. You likely have training. You may have sprint workouts. That's totally okay. That doesn't mean that everything's going to be ruined uh, to clarify that in, the, in your training. Chad's just talking about if you're truly time constrained, you can only do a couple sessions per week. This is the sort of thing you would want to do. And Brandon, in your case, since you're running and swimming and doing strength and everything else, this might be a bit too much uh, to just do like just the sprint workouts. It might be too difficult and compromise the rest of what you're doing. Might not. It might, it might be, but I think two times a week, especially when you're looking at just four sprints a workout and they are four all out efforts, 30 second mm -hmm. efforts, four and a half minutes recovery is pretty typical protocol. And, and they wreck you in the moment but the recovery beyond the moment is not that bad because you're not, you're just not doing a ton of work. I mean, when you get yeah. up to the point where you can handle 10 of these, uh, and I'm not, I can speculate the athletes might get there. I question where that, that, that productivity falls off. I, I don't mm -hmm. know that people, especially people who are balancing this with strength training, swim training, run training. I don't know why they'd ever really exceed probably six sprints in a workout. Sure. It sounds like track cycling. <laughs> It yeah. does. We actually yeah. had somebody in the chat earlier when we were talking about resting between intervals. They're like, I'm a track sprinter. I want to either yeah. be at max watts or nothing, you know? Yes. Like, yep. so. and in this <laughs> case, maximization is what you're after. So make those yep. recoveries. I mean, pause the workout if you want to, you don't have to limit yourself to four and a half minutes because the intention there is simply to get you on and off the bike within 30 minutes, really narrow time yep. frame. But if you've got more time, drag it out, make it, make it eight minute, 10 minute recoveries and give it everything you have for those 30 seconds. And I'd say, 
30 seconds, but there are workouts in there that are 20 seconds because I've dabbled in the 20 second versus 30 seconds. And I wish there was research comparing the two, because I would like to see where that productivity really falls off, what the further benefit is with that 20 to 30 second span. If you can achieve most, if not all of it, the whole Pareto idea in the initial 20 seconds and just call it good. Because mm -hmm. I got to say, hey, the final 10 seconds of a 30 second sprint, especially when you're two or three or four into a workout is, is just horrifyingly painful. So this is an interesting perspective, like an interesting approach that you could take if you have minimal time, your time constrained, kind of getting the most for a little bit uh, in terms of time commitment that you could have. There's tons of other ways too. And we've mentioned this before, like training becomes effective when it's a novel stimulus to your body, right? In the sense that if it's something that's either maintaining some sort of consistency, that's also very productive for you. If it's something that's upping that, that's also productive once again. So there is no trainer roads only good for athletes that can dedicate X days per week. Our plans you'll see, will start at three days per week. You can substitute one of those workouts out. You can change it out or you can use train now in that case. And I think it's a fantastic way to, to use train now and drop in. If Tuesdays are the days that you're going to do it, fire up trainer road and look at what train now recommends for you that day and give it a shot. That way you can go through and still get in the sort of fitness that you need, uh, while going like the training that you need while going throughout it, it's going to be well calibrated to you. It's a good way to do it. And we do have Nate would probably unplug the cord on me, but we do want to address your situation in the future. I'm just going to leave it at that. So, uh, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't get me in trouble. Uh, okay. Let's do the last question from James it says long question incoming long time listener and about one and a half years of trainer road under my belt. I come from a sports background before cycling, national level tennis, national level Olympic weightlifting, collegiate rugby, and competitive CrossFit were all my sports before I found my true love, bikes. Way to go, James. You've done a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, James says, I'm 24 and have an FTP of four watts per kilogram at altitude in Boulder, Colorado, after the one and a half years of actual training. I'm preparing for my first real mountain bike race and jumping into it with a doozy, Breck Epic. For those that don't wow. know, Breck Epic is five days. I think Chad, I think that we'll figure that out in just a bit. When he says it, I believe it's five days. It could be six and it's up at Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, which the base elevation is somewhere around 8,000 feet, I believe, but you Very only go high. up from there. Yeah. And I think that this race tops out above 13,000 feet, uh, very high Ooh. elevation. Um, even higher than Leadville, I believe, but I could be wrong there in terms of like the peak elevation when they go over Wheeler pass, it's very steep. It's very, very long climbs and it's uh, technical coming down. It's the sort of thing where you don't want to have a hard tail. That's for darn sure. So it's a really tough race. It's a famous race. Uh, okay. So, and this, they say, I have solid skills and seemingly good aerobic capabilities compared to the guys I ride with who have significantly more years of experience. My question though, comes from a unique, terrifying race opportunity that has just sprung up. I've gotten one of the last five remaining Leadville 100 spots through a contest. If I choose to accept it, I'd be doing lead Epic as they call it starting on Sunday with Leadville and then doing the six day stage race in Breck Epic. It seems like, and Breck and Leadville are about a half hour apart in the car. So it's pretty close to each other. So that's why this sort of thing is uh, feasible. It seems like a dangerous and stupid concept, but would it just be like turning the six day stage race into a seven day stage race, mm -hmm. or is it a totally new beast? I'm accustomed to big days on the bike, living in Boulder and exploring the vast array of terrain that we have here. Thanks so much for your program and podcast. I never miss an episode and wish I could say I never miss a workout. Hey, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> We're all in that boat, huh? Uh, Amber, you have more experience stage racing than Chad and I combined cloned many times over. So um, what do you say about this? I, I don't know how familiar you are with these events. I know that you know uh, tons of your friends have done both of these events and that sort of stuff. And But what, what advice would you have taking this six day stage race that is Breck Epic and then adding the absolute massive day that is Leadville before that. Well, it's, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Um, <laughs> Glad we're starting there. <laughs> we can, we can kind of talk in, in general terms, kind of high level terms, and then we can dig a little bit into more detail about what's involved in these two particular events. So I say all this with the caveat that I'm not a mountain biker. So Jonathan, Chad, please jump in and, and, add where I might miss something specific to mountain biking. But when we're talking about stage racing in general, um, like we just talk about multi-day races and 
really, it's very taxing. It is huge energy demand on your body um, within each stage and over the course of the multiple days of the stages. So you really have to get choosy about how and when and where you're going to use your energy. So mm -hmm. I would say if you're unaccustomed to stage races, one of the most important things you can do is to pick your battles. Decide ahead of time, like we talked about with the race planning, what are your goals and stick to them. So on the road in a stage race, there are a whole lot of things that you can go for. You can go for the sprint jersey, the climbers jersey. You could go for a stage win. You could go for the overall. There's a lot of different potential goals that you might be able to align with within the race. And in this case, I'm not sure that you'd want to go for the overall general <laughs> classification at Breck Epic. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe there's a particular stage that resonates with you and you feel like I really want to do well on that day. Maybe it's I want to survive. Um, but really get clear about what your goals are and then plan accordingly. I think when we talk about these two races in particular, there are two things that jump out at me that will be big challenges that would not necessarily be part of a regular stage race race. Um, one of those is logistics. So mm -hmm. this is just a sequence of seven days, true, but you're including two different races here, which means that you're going to have a transfer from one location to the other. So after you do Leadville, you'll be transferring to Breckenridge, which is not a super long transfer, but you still have to go through the registration, number pickup, all of the pre-race administrative things that you need to do when you start up a new race. So Packing up I everything be... where you're staying, moving it to the other place, like it, it yes. th those sort of things aren't insignificant. They should be absolutely thought of beforehand. Great point. Is Breck yeah. Epic so, a, a hub sort of race where you get to reside in one place or do you move? Yes. You get to stay in one spot, thankfully. Yeah. So you would still have that transfer between Leadville and Breckenridge, which mentally, you know, you have to be, it's kind of like when you're, you're climbing a hill, you're not, you, you can't like mentally tap out when you get to the crest of the hill, you need to be prepared mentally to be <laughs> committed to what comes after that. And so when you're racing Leadville that day, you have to be mentally committed to when you cross that finish line, you need to be ready to pack up, move, get ready to transfer to the next race. Um, you can't, you know, it's a lot of your friends are going to be able to just be like, Whoo, that was tough legs up you know, <laughs> going to just sit back and have dinner. Um, you'll have a little bit more to do ahead of you. So really plan around that. I would, I would do a lot of planning ahead of time to make sure that you minimize again, that cognitive load and stress that will come around with that. Um, that you can do a lot to mitigate that ahead of time. Second thing I think is really important for these two is altitude, altitude, altitude. Um, sounds like you live in Boulder, which is a great place to start, but let me tell you, I raced uh, the Colorado pro classic. And we had a time trial stage in Breckenridge and I was in Boulder with my team. We were there for almost a month before the race. So we were very well acclimated. The difference between Boulder and Breckenridge is significant and it gets more significant mm. and, and Leadville and it gets more significant as you climb from those locations to higher elevations and the higher the elevation, the more each foot of difference, uh, will impact you. So when you are used to doing a normal stage race, you might be able to burn matches in the sense of going into the red, maybe more frequently, longer. You might be able to go hit higher intensities above your threshold. Um, you need to be really, really conscientious about how deep you go into the red in these races, because what happens at altitude is when you go deep into the red, it becomes a lot more difficult to recover. And when you're talking about a multi-day race where every single stage is going to be at altitude and every single effort is going to have this extra cost attached to it, you need to be extremely judicious in when and where you decide to do that and how hard you want to go. So, um, with that, I would just say taking all of those things into consideration, put together a race plan and go for it but be really, really, um, diligent ahead of time about what your expectations are and what your goals are. I adding even I'm thinking of Chad, we crewed for Nate, then Chad, you crewed for me at Leadville. And in that process, I think both of us were like, can we please get away from this elevation as soon as possible? Uh, mm -hmm. just cause it starts so to add up like every day that you spend up there, it gets tougher. Think about it. 
I don't know of many, actually, I don't know of a single pro road race that does this. The closest we probably got was the Colorado classic, like uh, Amber was mm-hmm. talking about, because in most we cases, only they had jaunt- one, one yeah, stage up that high, one stage up that high. That was it. Everything else yeah. came back down towards Boulder. Yeah. They'll like jaunt up to altitude, then come back down. And I bet there's a race and like, uh, there are a handful of races that are really hard, really high elevation places like up in Bolivia or something like that. I don't know, but this has to be like one of the hardest stage races. When you look at the impact of elevation, it just means that every day you will feel worse than you would normally. <laughs> so like that office space clip, again, I think I mentioned it last week, but like every day is the worst day. And then the next day is actually the worst day. Like <laughs> in terms of how you will feel, that is likely an outcome because you just don't recover. Your sleep is compromised. Like everything is just tougher. Um, but one thing, I actually think that Leadville itself, I know this sounds crazy, lends itself well to like this stage race format, because here's the thing. You shouldn't be going super hard at Leadville ever. Like the only time that you will feel like that is likely on the power line climb. If you've paced it appropriately, because power line's so steep, that's just, there's, there's no way to get up it without going really hard. Other than that, you should feel like you are cruising at a sustainable pace all day. It's a long day and altitude, like Amber said, punishes you when you go into the red. So you shouldn't be doing that. In that sense, you'll also have the same experience at Breck. Like you you, you shouldn't be sprinting. You shouldn't be trying to stay with groups that are super fast. You should be looking at every day of how do I modulate my effort to avoid spikes and to stay consistent. And because of that, in one respect, the elevation is your friend because it makes the racing perhaps less punchy, less intense. And as a result, you may be able to stretch this out over multiple days. But the key is if you race Leadville and you're going all out, and if you find yourself going up Sugarloaf, or if you find yourself going up St. Kevin's or going up Powerline or Columbine, or or I shouldn't say Powerline, anything but Powerline, and you feel like you're going hard, it's going to bite you really hard when you get to, you know, day one, two, three, four of Breck Epic. It's going to be extremely tough. So you need to, if you do this, you have to make sure that you're governing your effort because otherwise it's just going to make it so that those days at Breck Epic, instead of turning into a cool experience, turn into true drudgery, (laughs) it would be Mm -hmm. really tough. Chad, what do you, what do you have to add to this? You just described Leadville as that something that you're not going to go hard. You can do it all day. And those two words are what concerned me all Mm -hmm. day. So you're going to proceed a six day stage race. That's already (laughs) extremely demanding and at altitude with an entire day of softening yourself up at altitude. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I think it sounds like a terrible idea. I'm just going to be blunt. If, 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 this is, <laughs> if this is a challenge that you feel you need to do and you just want to survive it, that's that's fine. Go go yeah. for it. You got a free entry to Leadville, which I bet they'd probably roll over to, to next year if you want to follow <laughs> my recommendation, which is to just do Breck Epic, table Leadville, because Bre- Breck Epic, Epic is a big enough challenge in and of itself without going into it effectively hobbled. I just can't see any good outcome from that first day at Leadville that's going to make your Breck Epic experience more enjoyable. And and if you have goals specific to Breck Epic, I, they're not going to work in their favor. Absolutely not. I'm getting bad thoughts, guys and gals. <laughs> I think I want to try this. Uh, <laughs> no. You're somewhat I, informed. You've done single track six. You've done events. This sounds like this is his first crack at this. So this would be akin to Nate and I saying, hey, you know what? We're going to go do single track six. It's going to be awful the whole time. <laughs> and, and, and this is new territory to us. But let's go ahead and do Leadville the day before. Yeah. <laughs> something, something we also haven't done. And, and it's going to be at an altitude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I, this, I'll- this. Sorry, go ahead, Amber. I was just gonna say, I'll propose a more positive spin on this. <laughs> I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to save him a, a grisly doom. <laughs> that's super positive right there. That's yeah. Chad being positive. <laughs> I love it. What Chad is saying is absolutely true. Um, this is going to be super, super gnarly, no matter how you slice it. Um, so I would suggest, like I was saying, you know, being really choosy about your battles, I would suggest you start with a goal of survival. And with that goal, your goal is to finish strong, which means mm. you have got to hold back big time 
Oh, Until the last way day. more than you think. Way more than way you more think. Than and you it's going to hurt your pride. Oh my gosh. Yep. Like, yeah, I'd like to know what, <laughs> what you, you say you're accustomed to big days on the bike. I'd like to know what those are because, you know, Leadville is going to be at four watts a kilogram heading into Rec Epic. What mm-hmm. are we looking at there? An eight or nine hour day? Yeah. Eight, optimistically? Possibly that you're going to be around eight hours, uh, give or take yeah. a half hour or so. That, if it's paced well, you know, the, the thing is, I'm well, <laughs> yeah. Like for context, I was like 150 pounds, I think when I did Leadville and I, oh man, Chad, I think I was, I was trying to stay at 200 or under 215 Watts was like my goal all day to not mm-hmm. break 215 Watts power line. That was impossible on portions of Columbine. It wasn't possible, mm. but going up like the first climb in the morning, St. Kevin's and going through, I remember everyone was like blowing past me and they all recognized me. They're like, what are you doing? Riding that slow, Jonathan? Like, and everyone blew past me. And if my pride was lumped into it, I would have totally gotten drawn out and I would have probably blown up later on, by the way, I passed all those people later, like, because <laughs> they, and That'd I wasn't, I didn't pass them with like crazy power. I was doing like yeah. 200 Watts. That was it. You but know? That, Amber just mentioned the nutritional side of things, which hadn't even occurred to me. I had, but it didn't voice it. So, so the depletion that's going to take place over something like Leadville, no matter Ooh. how carb loaded you come into it is going to impact every day of Breck Epic to follow. Yes. So again, oh, I don't, I don't want to rain on your parade here. This is, this is an exciting opportunity, but I think it's one of those opportunities that you just have to look back on and go, yeah, I made the right call. Get <laughs> dinner. before. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, pro tip on this one, Chad and I can say from experience, getting dinner after Leadville in Leadville is darn near impossible. It's <laughs> extremely tough. There's so many and people and there's not many restaurants so as a result, your options are going to be limited. Get dinner beforehand that you can just have ready thereafter, like, and get in like six dinners because you just did Leadville um, and you've got Breck Epic coming up. So like, yeah. you know, how you can yeah. avoid that dinner rush though. Yes. Just don't go to Leadville. <laughs> <laughs> I say again. <laughs> just, I, I mean, you're going to be eating all day every day, the, any moment you're not on your bike. And when you're on your bike, you're still going to be eating and that's how you're going to help yourself. But it's tough, but goodness gracious. I said it to everybody on the podcast that I'd never do Leadville again, but this does sound exciting. And yeah, somebody's pointing oh out in the gosh. live chat that Keegan did it last year. I remember talking to Keegan and he, he's weird though. He started like getting more and more excited every day as it went on, but he's a broken individual. So uh, that's just how he works. Um, but producer or sorry, Sean, in our live chat right now, trainer road employee says, I've never raced a mountain bike, John, but count me in too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Chad, your voice is being ignored. Uh, I absolutely That's am excited. Go ahead. Yeah. James, I'm excited to hear how you do with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if pace you're pacing, yourself. Yeah. And if you're pacing yourself appropriately for the magnitude of this challenge, it will feel like you are just going through the motions hmm. at first. Mm-hmm. Yes, it will. And if that's what it feels like, you're probably doing it right. Um, mm-hmm. And then, then you know, make a deal with yourself. If if you pace it really well and you're super conservative those first six days, then you can let yourself unleash on day seven and let us know mm-hmm. how it goes. But I wouldn't. I'd be I'd be super super conservative um, and dial in all of the details ahead of time. All of your logistics. Have all of your nutrition and your meals planned. All of your accommodations even the route that you're going to drive between the races, departure times, everything, get it all dialed because you're going to need every, every last ounce of energy, um, yeah. to get through this. Unless you're at the front of the pro men or women field, the way that you beat people at Leadville is by training and getting your watt KG nice and high before the event by eating really well. And then by not racing it fast, that's how you beat people at Leadville. It's by being consistent. It doesn't feel exciting. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. but that, and that's going to be to Amber's point. That should be how it feels throughout the whole race. This is great. I, I, if y'all think that this is the goal that I should put on the calendar for next year, let me know. Uh, that could be a good <laughs> one. That would be interesting content too, to see how Sean does his first mountain bike race being Leadville and then straight into uh Breck Epic. Also, I think that we have a name for your race, Chad Grizzly doom. There's the name <laughs> for the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good one. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us for watching this on YouTube. Once again, like thumbs up, subscribe. If you haven't tried out trainer road yet, what are you waiting for? Go sign up, give it a shot. 
put us to the test for your races that you have coming up. Use train now, just do a couple workouts a week, give it a shot and see how it works or commit to a full plan, build plan builder, do the whole thing. It'll make you faster. That's what we are all focused on. Uh, we'll talk to you all next week and submit those questions at trainerroadcom slash podcast. Talk to you soon. Bye everyone. Thanks everybody.